uh, the material. Um, great. So I'm switching over to presentation mode. Um, today's class is going to follow the spiral model that I articulated last uh, session. Um, and it's particularly going to focus on the second major modeling tradition, a major dynamic modeling tradition that we're covering, uh, agent-based modeling. Um, Agent-based modeling uh, is a uh, dynamic modeling approach that seeks to understand the behavior of complex systems through the lens of, of, of interactions between agents and either other agents or, or the environment. Um, it's very much uh, a tradition that focuses on individual agents and that focuses on their interaction um, not merely their evolution within an agent absent interaction as being of central interest. Um, some people talk about agent-based models or ABMs uh, for short, uh, crudely as, as bottom-up models. I'm, I, I've long been uncomfortable with that um, terminology because it implies there's some obvious bottom. And in if, if you uh, start engaging in modeling, you often find out that, you know, what's the bottom of one poor person's uh, frame of reference is just the very topmost level of another experts. And it, there's often a very active question of how, how far down do you have to go? Um, you know, it, it may seem obvious, for example, with something like uh, COVID-19 that, that the bottom is, you know, individuals, uh, but it, it's not so obvious when you get to issues such as how vi uh, viral growth and decay within a given person may put their life in risk. Um, uh, their level of immunity that they build up in response to a given variant of the infection might or might not hold with respect to uh, other, other variants of the infection. And um, in these cases, uh, we, we often are not sure about uh, just how far down uh, we have to go when we're dealing with this system. Um, so uh, here, uh, we're going to be uh, calling it an upwards facing tradition. Um, it's upwards facing in the sense that we specify things at a lower level, um, uh, at the level of uh, agent, uh, agent interaction and agent evolution within a, a given agent. And we, we study, having so done, um, so doing, we, we study the induced dynamics for the system as a whole. We can by specifying things at an agent level and, and counting the number of agents, say, who are infective, we can figure out how many infective people there are in the whole population. Um, uh, and uh, by totaling that up across the entire agent population, we can understand uh, the patterns at a high level. And these patterns for agent-based modeling are not merely temporal as they were with system dynamics. But, but also typically spatial and topological, meaning they, they can also have to do with um, the fact that agents are situated in a space, be it geographic or indoor space, um, or it could be topological in the sense that it has to do with connections between agents, their presence in, in networks um, uh, by which uh, agents interact. Perhaps there are social networks, perhaps there are contact networks, uh, family networks, but we can represent these in the system and often they're of, of front and center interest. Um, and we're interested often not only in how the system's behavior is induced um, uh, sort of over time as a whole, but also how it's induced across that network or across space. Um, uh, agent, uh, within this context, uh, agent-based mo models can vary strongly between very stylized models, um, on the one hand, models that are extremely sparse and that are really aimed to, to stir up insight and, uh, and learning uh, from very basic principles. Um, and uh, on the other hand, all the way down to very descriptively rich and empirically grounded, meaning lots of real world data in them, uh, rich characterizations of some real world uh, context, uh, say, the Saskatchewan context, and indeed agent-based models uh, uh, form the, uh, the central part of our uh, modeling strategy that we use uh, for the province for COVID-19. Um, I have a uh, substantial tradition over the years of emphasizing certain ways of specifying models, and it, it bears just noting <clears throat> this, uh, this approach because it, um, 
it highlights uh, most of the salient things you want to think about if you're if you're thinking about building an ABM. And really, that's what so much of this lecture and this series of three lectures is about. It's equipping those of you preparing to go into projects to be uh, prepared and starting through the thinking of what needs to go into that project for the stakeholder. Um, with agent-based modeling, often we think about the op parties framework, uh, outputs, um, what are the populations of interest? And then within each population, and sometimes for the environment as a whole, we think about the parameters. These are pre-specified assumptions about the agents, often either scalars, particular numbers, like you know their, uh, uh, th their uh, weight or height, if we treat that as static, or their age, if we treat it as static for the sake of simulating a short-term outbreak. Um, we also, though, talk about their state. That's the last one here. What, what aspects of their situation evolve over time endogenously? They're produced by the system. And then we think about actions that change the state and the rules that govern whether or not an action fires or when it fires, under what condition it fires. So something like if, if age were part of state, um, aging might be going on continuously. By contrast, someone's uh, catching COVID, uh, getting infected by the, uh, the virus that causes uh, COVID, the coronavirus, um, might be something that needs to be triggered by another person's presence where that other person is infected. So those would be associated with these rules by which my state would change. Um, there's time, uh, what, what are the characteristics of time? What's the time horizon, the length of time uh, over which we're simulating? And is it kind of discrete where we, we sort of go uh, jump forward among a set of, of um, uh, equally spaced time points or is it a continuous space where time evolves as quickly or slowly as it needs to simulate as the, uh, as the simulation plays out? We consider interventions that might, that might alter the system from, from above. Uh, maybe we uh, change the public health order to, uh, to, to uh, you know, rule out um, schools being open or so we, we close schools, or maybe we um, undertake a, a vaccination campaign in those with chronic disease. Those would be examples of intervention that external stakeholders impose on the system, and we're interested in seeing the effects of that uh, writ large across the system and maybe in subpopulations. And then typically a focal interest here is some environment, because often these agents are situated agents. Um, I, I emphasize that here, meaning they're placed in some context. Um, in the cognate area of, of critical realist philosophy, we talk about context, mechanism, and outcome. And here um, we're dealing with context. So agents are often situated in a particular place. Um, maybe it's logically defined. They're in a home or they're in a hospital or they're in a long-term care facility at any one time. At other times, it may be geographic. Um, uh, yet other times it may be, you know, where am I uh, placed within a school? What classroom am I in? Um, bearing in mind that, that COVID may be uh, spreading across that school. So we have an environment in which the, uh, the agents are placed. And this distinguishes a bit from what's called uh, the cognate tradition of micro simulation, which otherwise is very close, but really doesn't focus on agent-agent and agent-environment interactions traditionally as much. The weight is more on how do agents, diverse agents, uh, evolve on their own rather than an interaction. But those, uh, that tradition of micro simulation has really started coming together with agent-based modeling, which derives uh, largely from mathematics and computer science, uh, whereas uh, micro simulation from economics and social science. Okay, um, so agent-based models, I told you two lectures ago, uh, consist of one or more populations composed of individual agents, each associated with some of these things you saw here, parameters, state, uh, actions for changing that state, rules for evolving it, and then some means of interacting with other agents or with the environment, okay? Um, and we talk about the environment being how I interact with other agents as well, more, more generally. So it's the fact that I'm proximate to you in the environment physically that I can infect you by coughing. Um, 
or it's, it's the fact that you and I are both on uh, uh, Twitter that I can affect uh, your ideation by, uh, by adverse tweets I send. Um, so in agent-based models, we have a time horizon, we have some initial uh, state. Now, ABMs are very different from uh, system dynamics models um, in a number of, of different ways. They're, they're closer than they are different. They're both dynamic modeling traditions and therefore stand quite, quite different than say statistical traditions. They're, they're quite close together from a distance if you consider them as dynamic modeling traditions, but they have a, a lot of salient differences. And one of them is that um, in stock and flow modeling and in, in system dynamics modeling, compartmental modeling, whatever uh, term you wanna use for it, we have a small modeling vocabulary. We build these models up from, from just two major building blocks that you heard about last time, stocks and flows. And as we'll see, there are higher level constructs we sometimes build with those. There's um, patterns we put these together into, um, molecules as, as Jim Hines would call them, um, uh, that, um, that sort of compose them together into larger pieces like first order delays and second order delays and aging chains and co-flows and, and, and various other factors. Um, but we're building them out of stocks and flows. It's our brick and mortar, as it were, our nouns and our verbs. Uh, the power lies in the combination of these elements um, and uh, you know, we analyze the behavior of those. In agent-based modeling, we have a far larger modeling vocabulary and we use for a given model different subsets of this vocabulary to different amounts. Um, and the power here is in the flexibility and combinations of the elements um, and in a variety of analysis focus. Um, so uh, the ABM vocabulary, particularly as, as manifested in uh, agent-based modeling in any logic um, consists of a uh, initially dizzying array of different particular building blocks, parameters, events, multiple model mechanisms for specifying dynamics. Mind you, something like state chart specifies not only the state, but it specifies the actions that change the state and the rules by which they, they update. So do stocks and flows, incidentally. Um, we have uh, interagent communication via things like networks, um, and we have geographic context and we have mobility of agents. Um, we can have subtyping of agents that look, you know, um, we may have a person agent, but then there can be healthcare professionals, which are a type of person. And of those, there can be physicians and nurses and allied health professionals, such as, uh, such as uh, social workers and uh, occupational therapists, physical therapists, da, da, da. But there might also be uh, people who are, for persons who are not healthcare professionals, um, such as uh, those engaged in other essential work, or such as those who are uh, involved in um, in other spheres uh, of of importance, such as prisoners, etc., um, that have certain characteristics. So we can have subtype relationships between agents that are often rather rich. Um, we often spatially embed the agents. Uh, there's data output mechanisms. Uh, Often there's diverse types of agents. Uh, sometimes they're humans, but there might be, in some cases, uh, tests or 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 uh, contact tracing records or vials of vaccine. In some cases, that undergo processes and undergo processing. Um, uh, the the different uh, the difference between an agent and merely a kind of convenience uh, object. Um, often hinges on does it have behavior, but uh, even so, you can have highly agent. You can have highly um, ag agents or actors with high degree of agency that are not human. Uh, think about service dogs and some of our models that are that are agents that interact with humans and confer um, diverse benefits to them. So we have a very broad modeling vocabulary here, and agent-based modeling. I like to talk about being harking back to the Russian proverb, knowledge of the fox, whereas uh, um, stock and flow models and, and aggregate system dynamics models are hedgehog knowledge. That's an old Russian proverb that talks about the different types of knowledge to which I gave reference last time. 
Okay, so here we have one or more populations. And, you know, I went over this before, and I have no interest in, in dwelling on that. There's too many important things to, to talk about. The opportunity cost is too high. But I do want to emphasize a few points that I didn't make the first time. So we, we have these populations. And, you know, in the model, the, the population um, is typically going to draw on one or more classes of agents. So we might have a person class and a service dog class. Um, or maybe a person class and a, um, a class associated with uh, you know, particular types of healthcare professionals, contact tracers and uh, physicians and, and uh, those involved in lab work or what have you. So we have these classes. They should be distinguished by each other, uh, both in terms of characteristics and behavioral repertoire, sort of what, what behaviors can they undergo. If they only differ in degree, don't have a different class. It just same class, they just have different characteristics in terms of that class. But if they differ in terms of what behaviors, uh, the behaviors to which they are subject, to which they can, which they can undertake, that's when you'd have a different class. Um, now, these populations um, uh, can also be more than one in number, but we have at least one population of one or more such agent classes. And that population will hold one or more members of that one or more instances, as we'll say it, drawing on the language of object-oriented programming that probably most of you learned and hopefully loved in three, CMPT uh, 270. You can have, um, therefore, a set of people in the population. So each of these individuals is an agent that belongs to this population, which holds instances of this class, OK? Um, so we have these populations holding instances of class. And at any one time, this is a certain number of people in any one of those populations. Um, hopefully, as computer scientists, that's something you're you know, very, very familiar with, even if you have to kind of think it through. Um, OK. So uh, these agents have parameters and parameters specified, as we said, uh, particular uh, assumptions about a given agent or about higher level constructs. You might have parameters for a hospital in which the agents are embedded. You might have parameters for the overall environment that indicate its uh, seasonality, whether it's uh, what the, uh, the current uh, season is or what have you. Or, um, these these uh, would be um, fixed uh, quantities typically, they're pre-specified, so they're exogenously specified. Um, but um, you know, they would lend, for example, at an individual level, uh, each person a set of characteristics, okay? Um, uh, they are imposed uh, typically on that population. Um, I'm glossing over some subtleties here, but trying to convey the, uh, the overall points. Um, Parameters are a static quantity and in and, and any logic. And I'm going to weave together because I'm trying to get you going on, on your thinking about projects, some factoids that are specific to, to any logic's instantiation of agent-based modeling, which I consider particularly rich. Um, within this context, parameters do two things. They communicate assumptions, but they, excuse me, they, they encode assumptions, but they also communicate them from the point of creation to, to where it's used. So if you have a population of agents, that population is responsible for creating those agents. And it also um, communicates to each agent, this is your you know, ethnicity, this is your sex, this is your, your uh, age or what have you. Um, and, uh, and, and that can occur at different levels of the hierarchy. So we have agents embedded in other agents, something we'll talk about. Um, you, you can communicate it down. And the experiment will communicate to Maine, to the sort of Maine um, global environment, as it were, what assumptions to use when running the model as a whole. Uh, OK, so agent-based models, uh, the agents have, and sometimes the overall environment has state as well, and rules for evolving the state. So um, often, we encode discrete aspects of state. Um, we're talking discrete as in D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E, -E, not with double E. Um, this is not about secrets and sharing them uh, silently. This is about um, a countable number of things right, as compared to and contraposed with continuous uh, things. So here we have a set of possibilities, something that would be called categorical possibilities in, in other um, domains. Um, 
uh, and or or uh, the, and and we want to enumerate them, um, and we do so often in a state chart when those when our situation evolves over time. Um, when our situation is continuous, like I want to track my continuously fluctuating viral load level or my continually fluctuating weight level, um, we would use a different mechanism than state chart typically. Um, so here are two state charts. Um, and these state charts have to have, uh, depict different concerns, different spheres of concerns here. So we have an infection state chart and we have a, a, a state chart with respect to care seeking behavior, with respect to whether someone's open to to uh, say seeking care for a cough or, or for a uh, um, high fever or for a uh, shortness of breath for COVID-19. And uh, a given person, an agent who might um, contain these, be described, but their evolution is described by these state charts. At a given time, it's gonna be in exactly one simple state with respect to each of these state charts. So. For example, this person might be uh, in an infective state with respect to the infection state chart, but it, with respect to the to the uh, um, care seeking state chart, they're in the state of not open to seeking care. So they're in a specific state with respect to each of these state charts. Um, and uh, the state charts depict, as I noted earlier, not only the state of a given person, or aspects of that state, different aspects for each of these state charts, but they also depict the actions that can change that state. And those are depicted as these transitions, but moreover, the rules by which those actions take place, whether they're continuously going on or whether they occur at fixed time points or whether they occur at a certain uh, Poisson arrival, certain chance per unit time that will occur independent of what's happened in the past. You have a per day chance of, of um, you know, engaging in some, uh, some behavior, um, et cetera. So, uh, or whether it depends on agent agent interaction where you have to interact with me to get, for me to get infected, for example. You being an infective has to have to interact with me as a susceptible to get me infected. And these uh, different rules by which, so the, the action, so the states here are these yellow markers that you should have learned to read in CP270 and UML state charts, right? Those are the states. Um, the actions that can change the state are the transitions between those, those rectangular um, states. The, little icons indicate the rules and the rules correspond to, well, this little clock one is a timeout. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not in here, but one which showed an exponentially decreasing little curve is a, is a fixed rate per unit time. Um, uh, message received, that's this little envelope. That means, for example, you send me a message saying, you are exposed to COVID. And I go, oh man, uh, okay, I got infected. I was susceptible. Uh, I've received that message whilst I was susceptible. And now you have dragged me into the exposed state by sending me that message. Um, message passing, message sending may sound ornate, but it's actually one of the premier um, techniques in computer science that we have to deal uh, robustly with, uh, uh, with evolving uh, agents, agents who evolve asynchronously, asynchronously, kind of on different clocks. Um, and it can also be based on a predicate, a, a certain condition. Um, we can also have a transition trigger when I've arrived at a certain point. So maybe I present for care, I arrive at a hospital and care is, is conferred upon me. At least that's how it ideally works. By the way, this is this little decreasing curve, that's a, a, a rate transition. I, I hadn't seen it, but, uh, uh, but it's an example of a rate tra uh, tra transition. And you can have branches that basically, for example, you come here, you expose me, uh oh, okay, I've gotten exposed and I have a, I have a you know 5% chance of getting effective. So I roll a 20 sided die and if it turns up one, uh, I'm infected, otherwise I, I, I go back to susceptible because each facet has a 5% chance. Um, it's 20 sided after all. Um, okay, uh, 
Now we can have parallel state charts and each state chart by default evolves independently, but if you want to have coupling, you can. One state chart can change the, the rates by which the other evolves. One state chart can send messages to the other state charts. Uh, one state chart can uh, change the change the parameters in which conditional transitions depend, or excuse me, change the variables in which um, conditional transitions occur. So often we'll have one state chart depending on another. For example, someone being infective in the infective state and having very serious symptoms might lead someone to transition from being not open to seeking care to being open to seeking care, or from being open to seeking care to actually seeking care. So often these state charts might be shown as kind of solitudes visually, but there's often interactions between them that are, are very significant. Um, and when we build models with stakeholders, we build models up, we prize uh, visual representation so we can discuss these things with stakeholders. And often we put into place these um, hierarchical state charts, okay? so. You'll notice here, and I apologize for the visual insult, um, but you'll notice that there are these larger boxes in which, si in which what would appear to be sort of mini state charts live, um, each with their own entry point and so on. The entry point of an overall state chart is that thing up here at the top with the bar and the dot, but within the, uh, the, the um, hierarchical state chart called a composite state within any logic, you have an entry point. Um, so when you go into this uh, composite state, you're subject to this dynamics uh, within that state. And that's useful for, for many reasons. Amongst other things, uh, if you go where my mouse is now, you can see, for example, here's a composite state, one of these hierarchical states that contains others. And you can just write one transition going out that holds um, logically uh, and by extension for any state within it. So I could be in the blue state here, I could be in the yellow state, I could be taking street drugs or, or having prescription opioids, but in any case, uh, I may transition to the state of becoming a former user um, of those opioids. So, um, so any of these internal states is subject uh, to that transition and same thing with this. Uh, that affords us a certain economy in how we specify these things and can allow us to um, associate higher level behavior with, with a grouping of states. It can also allow us to just ask, am I a former user without getting into the vagaries of, am I in this darker blue state or this lighter blue state within this? Uh, there's a more general grouping implied. Um, here, as in aggregate stocks and flows, you remember back to, uh, to earlier, I, if, I, if I were, a betting man, I could probably show you some of the slides. We had people in last lecture, we had people distinguished susceptible, infective, recovered, for example. And that may strike you as quite similar to, to this. Um, and it, you'd be right, um, it's with good reason. You'd be right to, to think that it's quite similar. Um, there's a number of differences though. Uh, we can have multiple state charts, each operating in a different sphere not as solitudes, but with maybe some interactions as desired between them. Um, but within a stock and flow diagram, we'd have to consider all combinations of them. So if I were to be infected with this variant of COVID and that variant with COVID um, at any stage of either one, I'd have to somehow have a state for like susceptible, susceptible state, you know, a susceptible infected with conventional COVID, another uh, susceptible, um, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with a variant uh, or infective with a South African variant, but susceptible with respect to uh, conventional COVID, or I'm infected with respect to both South African variant and, um, and with respect to traditional COVID. I'd be an unhappy camper then. Um, watch out, it's coming. Um, get ready. Um, it's, it's, it, we're not on the down downhill yet. Um, we've got four variants we're tracking right now. Um, Brazil, South Africa, UK, and one from proximate California. Um, watch out, some of them are nasty, may evade vaccine-induced immunity, uh, may evade natural immunity. Um, we ain't out of the woods yet. 
Okay, so um, here we can have multiple state charts at the same time and parcel out things neatly into each of those state charts without considering all common combinations of them. It's not a combinatorial exercise as well. It's just summing up the number of states rather than having all multiplication, the product of all their states. For parallel flows, there's no need to consider these, these combinations. And uh, we can keep track of things that are continuous, like how long an individual has been in a given state, and we can change the transition rate, whereas that turns out to not be possible within system dynamics models because we're not tracking individuals. We're just counting the number of people in each state, in each stock every over time without saying, is that the same person as it was two, uh, two weeks ago who's infective, et cetera. So we have these uh, hierarchical states uh, that I mentioned. This is from a, a model of chronic wasting disease built in this very class. Um, probably the most, the most or the second most sophisticated model of chronic wasting disease. We have one built in our lab right now by one Leah Lamp that's uh, also outstanding. Okay, underneath all of this, is a model of continuous time in any logic whereby events can happen as fast as they need to or as slow as they need to. And there's a thing called the, we're between computer scientists here, so I need to convey this to you, a discrete event schedule. There's a schedule in continuous time that schedules when events fire. And um, if I come into a state, uh, which for example, has a certain timeout associated with it or a certain rate transition out, um, it will go ahead and, and schedule that in the schedule for coming up saying, you're gonna leave here at this time. It's kind of like, this is your next appointment. And so it'll schedule that into, into the schedule. And events can get deleted from the schedule. So if I'm a deer in the summer grouping, but I die before summer is out, that, that uh, event will get descheduled. Um, and so it will, it will no longer fire. Okay, um, or if I leave via another route, for example, I move into rut season, watch out. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, you, you don't want a professors in rut. Um, it, it will go to this state here and um, uh, that will lead to uh, that, that event that was scheduled being uh, descheduled, okay? Um, don't worry, I'm, I, I won't go into to rut. Um, okay, uh, so, um, we can also, as part of the AnyLogic vocabulary schedule, we can also declare, reify, turn into objects, um, uh, what are called events uh, here. And, and the terminology is confusing. Um, really what we're talking about is event schedules. Okay, this is, should be read, reified event schedule objects. Um, and these come in two forms. One is, uh, which, I'll, which I'll call a regular event object. Um, it's, it's a pre-specified schedule of one or more events, pre-specified in the sense that we say, hey, look, we want events to, an event to occur at this time, or we want events to occur every two weeks from now on, or um, at, um, uh, at, at Poisson arrivals at sort of random times, um, uh, independently spaced, um, uh, from, from now on for this event, given event to occur. And then by triggering that event, there's a handler that says, oh, the event occurred, now we undertake some, some action. Um, so uh, and these event schedules uh, can, can trigger off maybe reporting where you report the number of infected deer or the number of infected people in long-term care and hospitals and for the overall population for COVID-19, for example. Or the event might uh, undertake in some cases a, um, an intervention so maybe you have every month uh, a, uh, a vaccination campaign that's undertaken, or maybe the event is triggered by a condition, uh, the occurrence of an outbreak, and we undertake an outbreak immunization campaign focused on the uh, group affected by the outbreak. So if it's an outbreak in long-term care, we, we go in with our uh, public health nurses and so on, and we vaccinate people in that facility and all the facilities served by the nurses who, who also work in that facility because there's a lot of moonlighting going on. Um, or a dynamic event, you can actually have multiple instances of it declared ahead of time and, and you, you schedule it and it will uh, a fire later. It's a bit like uh, a closure um, uh, that will occur later if those, for those of you who have taken um, the functional programming 
uh, course uh, within uh, within your training. Um, uh, th 340, I think. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, there's a bunch of different ways we can schedule these events, timeouts or at a fixed rate or a one-time basis or when a certain condition changes. And um, we, we use these to, to trigger things within the, the model. Um, okay, um, beyond those, time is short here and we have a lot of material to cover. Um, uh, Agent-based models uh, would, would not be true to the age-based uh, tradition if, if they didn't emphasize uh, interaction between agents. That's what I've, what I've specified thus far all relates to things within an agent. And that's all well and good. And the micro simulation tradition deals with all these sorts of things. But what really tends historically to distinguish agent-based modeling and has brought it into its own as a point of attention is the interaction uh, between agents, whether it's um, Tasmanian devils with devil tumor facial disease and susceptibility to it, or whether it's deer with respect to chronic wasting disease, or mosquitoes and humans and birds with respect to spreading West Nile, or whether it's aspects of COVID-19 spread or TB spread or STI spread, such as chlamydia and gonorrhea, or spread of HIV AIDS. Um, this is uh, spread HIV and it could lead to AIDS eventually. Um, the, uh, the interactions are often front and center what we're interested in with agent-based modeling. It's the interactions between agents and agents in their environment that, that really uh, are at the heart of agent-based modeling, much as feedbacks and accumulations were at the heart of system dynamics model. Um, so uh, here, um, we need to talk about how do agents interact. And um, the, the foremost way within any logic uh, that agents interact, and it's a foremost way within agent-based modeling more generally, because it, it reflects the need for asynchronous uh, uh, actors to interact is with messages. Um, uh, if, if I'm one agent, you're another agent, um, we can interact uh, by uh, me sending you a message or you sending me an as a message. And I can put as a payload for this message, uh, a message um, that will give you some information um, about it. So it may, it may say, you're exposed and this is the person who exposed you. Um, so you can record who it was that infected me. Um, or it might say something about um, my viral load and whether you get infected or not also depends on your immune status, for example. Um, and commonly these messages are spread locally. Einstein once said, he doesn't believe in spooky, dis uh, spooky action at a distance. And most um, uh, actions are in some sense local uh, in the world. Um, um, they may be physically local, think spread a pathogen, or they may be uh, topologically lo local, like uh, I can influence you with a conspiracy theory if you're on my social network, but we're connected with that social network. Um, so often messages are sent over a network of some sort that may be mediated by space, like I'm only connected with people right around me, or it's mediated by some logical connection, like I speak to family members on the phone frequently. Um, uh, and uh, this constitutes a major mode of interaction. There are ways for agents to interact continuously, maybe for me to be linked to you, for example, via stock and flow. Maybe I'm an agent who's shedding, shedding aerosols for COVID-19, and maybe we represent the workplace having its own processes and so on as an agent. And I shed my aerosols into the workplace in ways that accumulate and, and expose others in the workplace. Uh, if, I may, if the agent is, is workplace as well, a higher level agent, I might, might spread continuously into that. Um, so messages are handled in many ways. So if I send a message to you, um, uh, it's handled in, in many ways, but we saw one of them, which is um, by a, a message transition in a state chart. So uh, here we have it. And unfortunately, it's very small, but uh, with uh, your youthful eyes, uh, you, I'm confident you should be able to, most of you should be able to make it out. It's that little envelope on that transition there. Remember, 
we, we have these rectangular shapes, which represent states. We have these transitions between them, which represent actions by which one person can change from a state to another. They're only susceptible, they're only governed by that possible action if they are in the state whence it comes. So the state, so in other words, to leave via this one that's highlighted here with green on either side, they have to be in the susceptible state. It's, that's the only case where they could leave via that, that transition out. It's like a finite state automata for those of you who have taken the required course or the, the elective course within our department, which I highly recommend. Um, so here, if I'm in a susceptible state, I am subject to transition out via infection. But the thing that will trigger it is a message. And that's the little, uh, uh, little uh, the indication that it's a message is, is uh, denoted by it uh, having this, uh, this envelope. Um, and uh, there's only in this case, um, well, this is a, a factoid that you don't need to worry about, but um, we can have multiple message types within a given model. This happened to be from one in a, in a simple model I'll be providing to you hopefully today that, um, that indicates there's only one message type extant, so I don't have to check what, what message type it is. I'll say unconditionally, if I receive it, I'll go to an infectious state. Um, I can also send a message. That's this transition here, and you'll see that at a certain rate of contact while I'm in the infectious state, I will send a message to a random neighbor within my network. That's shown down here. Um, messages can be sent to kind of designated groups of individuals or designated rules for individuals such as random neighbors or, or random agents or all agents or all agents to which I'm connected. Think about me sneezing and exposing all people around them. Apologies for the um, uh, for the uh, impression, um, uh, or they can be sent to a specific agent, and this is the API call within AnyLogic's Java libraries. Um, okay, so we can have agents; they can be arranged in networks, and uh, the networks will often mediate the the interaction of those agents in terms of uh, who receives their messages, for example, um, within this environment. And we may be interested in viewing, uh, as we are here, the spread, say, of infection or a rumor or a conspiracy, belief in a conspiracy theory, et cetera, across that network. Um, okay, um, so, so that had to do with topological embedding. And any logic allows for defining these networks in very nice ways. Um, the primary way is um, uh, in, in Maine associated with uh, the uh, the population, um, you can you could specify uh, within within one of those you could specify the um, the network type which applies by default and basically say it's a distance based network where everyone's connected with anyone who lies within two meters of each other or you can say it's a scale free network which we'll learn about which exhibits power law relationships over the number of people connected to a given person, um, et cetera. And uh, we can capture those in those uh, environments. Okay, um, beyond that though, beyond uh, in, in embedding people within networks, any logic allows a rich uh, capacity to embed people spatially. And it does so into different types of spatial environments. Um, and spatial embedding is often of central interest to us. Um, regardless of whether people move or not, um, uh, them being situated at a given point in time in a, in a spatial environment is often really of interest because it may govern spatial locality, whether I can influence you, say, with pathogen uh, or by a um, non-electronic utterance. Um, uh, it may limit my influence in terms of, of transmission. It may also lead us to understand uh, certain uh, phenomena, um, you know, that we might see uh, empirically, and have us uh, wonder why do we see that? Well, we'll, we'll build a model that will capture it. Um, and spatial embedding can permit geographic embedding of geographic information system information. So, uh, as our ABM is for the province, we can have it represent each city and town within the province and interactions of people throughout the province. 
in a spatially grounded manner, in a geographically grounded manner. Now, any logic, roughly speaking, it offers four options for spatial embedding. And any logic here, again, is particularly rich. You'll find different subsets of these in different packages. Uh, it can allow for discrete cells of interaction, starting down here at the bottom. We divide up, or, or the, the fancy word for it is tessellate. We divide in a mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive way the space into a set of grid squares. And I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not uh, more evocative in my, in my sort of depiction here. But we divide up into columns and rows, uh, each of which is disjoint, um, and they collectively cover everything. Um, and there's only zero one agents in any given cell at one time. Um, so it can either be live or dead with respect to a given, given agent. Um, uh, alternatively, uh, we can have people uh, embedded in a continuous way. This is the topmost one, in a continuous way. So I have some location in space. Um, my location is not mutually exclusive of yours. Um, you, can, you could view it as you know, the view from 30,000 feet um, for all intents and purposes, you don't have to worry about representing whether two cars overlap in space. Um, rather, you, you, you just treat them as kind of passing uh, below you or other planes flying below your plane. You know, you, they, they pass and there's no physical exclusion. Um, you, you can, things move around in sort of ghostly ways uh, that pass each other. Essentially, they're points. And and pass each other as, as infinitely small points. Um, uh, now, we can put in place rules for collisions and so on, and, and some of you will be meeting that in the problem sets uh, down the road in this class. Uh, we can all alternatively put people in GIS space, geographic space, um, where there's each agent is associated with latitude and longitude, and there may be resources like uh, um, uh, roads or, or physical uh, uh, barriers like rivers and lakes and mountains or what have you at different places. Um, it's a continuous space. There's no physical exclusion. And you can also load in what are called GIS shape files, which, which load you, allow you to load in very particular information. Okay. And then finally, um, we can have uh, an embedding in a physical space with what's called the uh, uh, the uh, the AnyLogic Pedestrian Library. And this, this was actually created by one of the members of uh, this class, uh, Zeshan Ahmad, um, uh, which, you know, it might be taken as showing a, a rather vigorous uh, coordinated calisthenic exercise, um, but um, uh, it, it, it happens just not to depict people in their appropriate uh, positions, which are seated in front of theaters. And um, you could see various infective individuals who are scattered amongst them. Um, uh, so we can also place people in the context, say, of a hospital and simulate the flow of people capturing uh, some aspects of waiting times and uh, waiting queues, et cetera, as they await care in various patient care rooms or are, are, are circulated for various types of imaging, such as CAT scans and X-rays and BQ scans and ultrasound scans, et cetera. Um, uh, so um, here we, we might be interested in, in you know, how crowded the waiting room is getting. Um, there can only be a certain number of uh, clinicians in a given room at a time, a uh, certain number of patients, and that, that uh, limits us. And we might be interested in, um, in understanding uh, aspects associated with that. Uh, within a 3D spatial environment, we can uh, similarly capture rather evocatively uh, uh, sort of the layout of a facility in a way that can be uh, helpful for stakeholders. Um, I'm going to come back to those with mobility in just a minute. All of this is, is not specifically talked about mobility. It's talked about situated agents, regardless of whether they move or not. Um, so uh, we do have irregular spatial embedding and um, uh, here it, it can be accomplished in two different ways pedestrian library and with this what's called uh, network uh, based modeling within any logic. I think that's still its name um, uh, within any logic. But, um, you know, this, these sorts of embedding can then lead, give rise to patterns. And the patterns that are observed here, as I enunciated in the first few minutes of this very session, 
uh, can be of multiple sorts. They're not merely patterns in time, although we, we, we do get patterns over time. You see the bottom of this, for example, but they're often patterns over space. So this being a distribution of prions uh, dropped uh, by, um, by afflicted uh, uh, cervids. So, so in this case, uh, white-tailed deer um, with uh, mule deer. I, I think it's mule deer actually, sorry. Um, uh, with uh, chronic wasting disease, a type of misfolded protein disease uh, using these misfolded proteins called prions, which is a lethal disease. And you do get some dynamics induced on the uh, population over time. Um, you know, how many, um, uh, how many uh, agents, in this case deer, are at different uh, points in their natural history of infection, susceptible versus subclinical non-shedding versus having outright clinical symptoms, et cetera. But um, we also get these spatial distributions, which can be emergent as well. Uh, these can be patterns that we don't anticipate, but are induced by the rules by which govern agent-agent interaction and, and agent evolution. And these can be, again, over space and networks. So you can get really interesting patterns without mobility. There's no agent movement here. It's simply agents transmitting to each other with certain probabilities, et cetera. And you can get uh, very, very interesting patterns of waves of infection, for example, induced in space when each person only can, can uh, interact with those right around them. Um, now, uh, uh, one of the uh, foremost ways in which we uh, bring together agent-based models and spatial embedding is with geographic information. And geographic information can be used in very rich ways to affect agents and, and reflect agents. So for example, we can ask how far is an agent from a given resource, maybe it's a fresh fruit and vegetable store, a, a store selling fresh fruits and vegetables at, at affordable prices. And that may govern uh, the diet associated with that individual, um, how healthy it is. Um, uh, we, we might route in an environment an agent along particular paths, maybe they're car routes or, or you know, bike path routes in ways that um, uh, bring them through different areas of a space or that mean they have to go uh, through a longer traversal than a geographic distance alone would suggest and crow's flies distance would suggest. We can associate agents with resources that are nearby them. For example, uh, 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 deer with, with uh, fresh, uh, fresh grass or moose with, uh, uh, with browse um, near, nearby. Um, we can uh, create information on background risk of exposure in different areas, such as the risk when a, when a given um, susceptible agent uh, is, um, that's the gray, comes into a given area of this lakeshore margin. Um, uh, if, if it's an area with a lot of prions, uh, red, they'll quickly become infected. But if it's an area absent prions, such as these areas down here, which have low prions, you have a disproportionate number of susceptibles because they haven't gotten infected yet. Whereas these ones up here, susceptibles who went to the lakeshore got infected by the, uh, by the prions and it worsened you know, successively. It was a vicious cycle. Um, uh, and often our interest is in mobility patterns. Um, and uh, here we're, we're going to the topic of agent mobility, because not only are agents often situated in space, but they are lent legs, as it were, to traverse that space. And of course, with legs, I, I speak figuratively. Um, uh, we might equally well have, as we have in some of our boot camps hosted in no less than our fair um, university, uh, we've had models of bat behavior where, where the agents are bats and, and they take wing instead of moving on legs, um, but I digress. Um, so uh, we have mobile agents, uh, whether via flight or, 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 or legged locomotion or indeed slithering, um, uh, agents um, can move. And, and this often induces very interesting behavior, very interesting emergent dynamics and sometimes surprising dynamics from it. Because no longer is it me waiting here until the infection reaches me as a situated person through my social network? It's coming closer and closer, and then it you know, comes close enough uh, to me to, to put me at risk. 
but uh, now we have people bringing bringing the infection around, and and the infection spread is not just a matter of of how quickly it spreads from one person to another, but how quickly do people move within the province. So if you have people going up to vacation homes in the summer, for example, in the north, that may bring infection to northern communities a lot faster than if it had just spread through dialysis visits and you know social visits from the north to cities um, for COVID-19. Um, or if you have people going back and forth to work sites in northern uh, Alberta, like Curl Lake, back to northern communities in Saskatchewan, they might bring the infection back and forth between them. Um, so mobility is often of central interest in, in governing behavior when it occurs. Um, and uh, we can have a variety of mobility-based methods. You know, we can have mobility being hard-coded. This person goes between this work site and their home community. Or we can have preference-based mobility where it's based on risk perception and, and based on where I want to go to get to reach my goals or what have you. Or we could have social mobility where I want to get from A to B, but I have to wend my way through a crowd, for example, perhaps while trying to adhere to some sort of social distancing, something captured via the pedestrian library at some level within any logic. Um, and we can capture this in these different spatial embedding environments of which we spoke not uh, 45 minutes thence. So we have um, continuous embedding. Um, there's a wonderful example model. Well, wonderful in the emergent behavior, not so wonderful in the code um, called wandering elephants uh, where elephants wander around a landscape and, uh, and, and browse and, and uh, consume uh, consume uh, quantities of, of water um, and denude certain areas of, of the environment, of vegetation, et cetera. Um, uh, there's no physical uh, uh, exclusion here and they move in certain directions and speed um, uh, and uh, make a beeline for water when they're thirsty, et cetera. There are um, discrete uh, environments where people could move between cells uh, there's an example model called shelling segregation model that I'd recommend to you, which has been highly influential in shaping our understanding of uh, why we see patterns of residential segregation emerging within uh, a distressing number of cities. Um, and uh, what it shows is that even small preferences for people to live near people who look like them um, can lead to disproportionate uh, overall groupings as people sort into different areas. And, and collectively, any one person's movements are very you know, uh, marginally affected by the preference perhaps uh, and stochastically so, but, but the overall behavior is unmistakable, profound and unsettling in the sense that it leads to communities almost separating out by uh, ethnicity or by uh, uh, by um, political attitude or, or what have you. Um, uh, particularly, uh, particularly shocking, uh, uh, you know, uh, reference points within um, some of the behavior in, in uh, U.S. cities that, that stimulated its work by Nobel Prize winning uh, econ economist uh, Thomas Schelling. Um, he did his work with these uh, Schelling segregation model on a checkerboard um, literally a checkerboard, um, and um, and you now have powerful modern computers that can um, do all of that. Um, you know, do uh, hours and hours of work on a checkerboard within milliseconds. Um, and we can have social mobility in three D environments according to what are sometimes called social force models. So, uh, you know, I want to evacuate my uh, building. Perhaps it's it's burning. It's a thick as skyscraper. I want to evacuate it, but lots of other people are making their way to the exit. I have to kind of put myself in the queue and jostle in there to make sure that that I can get out and, and hopefully bring those who have less easy mobility um, and ferry them to safety as well. And uh, at the same time, I, I'm, I can only get so close to other people. Um, and this is, you know, more 
profound yet if there's social distancing in place and, and we have to somehow crowd into a classroom while somehow you know, engaging in social distancing. Um, and this, this is uh, well addressed with the pedestrian library. Uh, okay, now last time we saw with system dynamics that um, this is a tradition characterized uh, under the hood uh, by differential equations. Uh, and differential equations are, are traditionally, though not exclusively, ordinary differential equations and therefore deterministic. And, and what I mean by that is the state at any one time uniquely determines how that state will change over the next little bit of time, the next dt, the next small increment in time. It determines in shorts the values of the flows, the rates of change um, by which the stocks will change at any one time. And it's completely set. Um, one of the consequences of this is if I take the same model in the same initial state, same assumptions about parameter values, and I run it again, I'll get exactly the same results. It is not so about agent-based modeling. And you may think that it's a shortcoming of one technique or another, but it's, it's not so. They reflect the different questions. System dynamics, as I articulated to you last time, ladies and gentlemen, um, seeks to maintain a, um, a, certain, um, a certain level of distance from the, um, the underlying situation. Uh, it, it seeks not to get involved in what events there are, the particular peculiarities, whether this particular person is, is seeking care, for example. Um, whether this particular person who is infected twice before is the one who gets newly infected now. Um, it, it tends not to, to, to get into the issues of whether this person who receives a message via social media about a distressing event develops uh, adverse um, uh, ideation that might lend them to depression. It rather tries to capture patterns, overall sort of levels of, of um, of occurrence of, of certain phenomena. And as such, it doesn't get into whether it's the same person who's still in the infectious state from earlier. And it doesn't get into the vagaries of whether it's you know three people this time and two people next time and four people. It's just on average, it's 2.5 people leaving per unit time, per week, let's say, um, being discharged or, or what have you. Uh, by contrast, agent-based models are avowedly upwards facing models. I, I use the, uh, the I, I sort of abuse the language by saying bottom up models was, was often used, though again, I think it does a disservice. But the point is we're dealing with low level phenomena. We are dealing with events. We are dealing with individuals. And when it comes to the realm of individual behavior, whether it's uh, service dogs, or persons um, in the general population, or um, whether it's uh, mule deer, uh, or whether it's um, uh, Tasmanian devils or physicians, uh, behavior has its stochastic components. Um, uh, there's, you know, oversights, uh, forgotten things. Uh, people can't get to the elevator in time that happens to expose them to the would have exposed them to the infective. Um, Etc. There's there's a lot of vagaries of stochastics of happenstance, and um, and so for modeling things at that level, we typically make use of a model where we dignify those stochastics by representing them in the model. So instead of transitions occurring in some lockstep way or some way that's precisely specified for each point in time. There's a dice being rolled um, over time. There's chance that, that governs whether or not your exposure of me actually infects me. Um, there's chance governing whether that person who is a real social butterfly get, is the one that gets infected and goes to Diva's nightclub and uh, you know ends up infecting a lot of people. Um, uh, or whether they go to Diva's nightclub in a given event when they're feeling a little bit under the weather. Um, so if we, if we want to characterize things at a level of individual, we have to deal with this happenstance. 
And guess what? It turns out the happenstance can be really important. It can sometimes be a little bit like the, the tail that wags the dog. Uh, it can have disproportionate impact. Uh, it can be a bit like the butterfly effect where a butterfly flapping its wings in North America or in, in Brazil can lead to a tornado in, in Texas. Um, that was the, the old analogy. Um, these chaotic systems, these systems which have nonlinearity, which have these positive feedbacks of which we spoke last time and which I illustrated. Alas, my rod is gone. Okay, I, um, I had it next to me through this very morning, but I, I think uh, I think there's another agent involved. Um, um, so uh, when we have these positive feedbacks, ladies and gentlemen, they can amplify these small changes into big changes. And when when it comes to COVID-19 and spread, um, you know, one person can breed uh, three people infected, can breed nine people total, can breed 27, 81, 243, etc. Right. Um, so here, how do we deal with these things? If, if, if each run is different, how do we reason about them? Well, we embrace that fact. We, 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 we deal with factors that allow us to, to be robust despite it, but we also take advantage of these stochastics. Um, so to be robust to it, to make sure our conclusions are not you know, that we draw, we don't draw the conclusion from any one run. We, we run things many times. And, um, and to make sure we're, we're not, you know, hinging our decision-making on a fluke, uh, we, we uh, run it many times and we see if there's broad regularities that come out. And often there are. There's, uh, it, it's, it's not just, you know, total, total sort of uh, 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 chance, uh, chance events with no rhyme or reason every time, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. It's not like that at all. Often there's broad regularities, and then there's some, you know, variability around that. Um, so in this case, we, um, we run it many times, and we can see those regularities because they're conserved across many runs. We see them again and again and again and again. Um, and we can summarize statistically, uh, this is one of the reasons having some exposure to statistics is advised. Um, we can summarize statistically things like the median or the means, and we could specify something about the uh, the breadth of that distribution, where the 25 percentile is or 75th, and summarize you know most run 50 percent of runs lie within that band, within that envelope, etc. Um, but these stochastics are also an asset. Observing the variability can lend insight into variability C in the real world data. And sometimes we see things in real world data that are really confusing. And we, we wanna know, look, is, is that just chance? Could that just be due to chance? But it's often not just chance. It's chance with the structure of the system interacting in ways that lead to interesting patterns. And by building an agent-based modeling, capturing this uncertainty in it, these stochastics, this rolling of the dice, stochastics is randomness over time. Um, we can often see if, if you know, this could be explained just by that, that variability. Um, so we expect a certain sometimes up and down, you know, associated with a given measure. Mm. So for a given run of a model, a given realization, as we call it, we might see a certain set of outcomes. For example, uh, incident cases here in, in the low socioeconomic groups uh, or in the high socioeconomic groups. This is cumulative number of cases over the entire run. Uh, in orange, it's a kind of a bar that indicates it's just short of 2000. And here's another one for high SES. But if we were to run this many times, let's say 50 times or 100 times, et cetera, um, what we'd see is that there's a distribution over these. This uh, 2000 is actually on the kind of on the low side of an upper part of the distribution here for low SES. Sometimes low SES has upwards of 2,500 cases. Sometimes it's just most commonly it's, it's, it's just or very commonly it's just short of 2,500. Um, but then there's an anomalous set that are down here at 1,500, very small number. And, and then look at this. There's quite a few where the infection dies out altogether. And actually that's the, that's the plurality here 
um uh that's that's mode like that's the single most common that's the mode of this distribution is down here the single most common outcome is actually zero cases um but low ses uh, as a general rule has higher number of cases than high socioeconomic group that's that's this one here in magenta um um, magenta tends to have fewer, and, and if you were to unpack this big bar, I think you'd, you'd find most magenta ones are also, or the plurality of them are also down here in the, the zero range. Um, so uh, here over time, we get kind of an envelope, and I'm not showing it well, but if you were to sort of slice this at time 700, for example, and look at it from the side, you'd see a distribution which is kind of low up here above 2000. And then it's gonna rise and probably have a peak somewhere around here. And then it's gonna, it's gonna precipitously decline as you get close to zero. Um, okay, so, so here we can, uh, we can capture uh, those effects uh, of stochastics. Now, uh, I haven't spoken about um, much about hierarchical models, uh, but, um, uh, I do a disservice to agent-based modeling if I weren't to do so, okay? Um, uh, agents in uh, agent-based modeling, I've whispered as it were at times here, I've hinted that they need not be always the very lowest level actors that you're familiar to think about. So you might have people, for example, but if there's a long-term care facility that has certain processes associated with it, certain screening processes, certain processes associated with closure rules, a certain you know, processes associated with bathing residents or what have you, um, maybe you represent that as an agent too, or maybe a hospital could be an agent. Um, uh, maybe a city or a neighborhood could be an agent. And then you have this kind of nesting of agents and agents. You might have people within a long-term care facility who are residents, others of whom are staff, um, and then within the, uh, the long-term care facility, you could compute statistics that reflect that population within it. The agents within a facility might be in some sort of networks um, and you know, staff that care for a certain ward of the, of the facility might have particular close interactions with those. And uh, those effects at that low level might induce patterns among long-term care facilities. And then long-term care facilities might be joined. And I apologize for the rather, um, the, the poor aesthetics associated with this. Um, uh, you could tell that art was not my foremost calling in life. Um, uh, here, um, here we might have uh, two facilities joined if a staff member who works at one facility also works at another. Um, they moonlight perhaps, you know, uh, for part of their week at another facility. And um, they might bring the bug back and forth between those facilities. So it might start in one, but make its way to others by spreading via these networks. So we have these different scales which can be induced. And agent-based modeling is, is very um, expressive in allowing us, and very natural in allowing us to express this structure. The fact that we have in the real world an embedding of sorts, a nesting of you know, students within classrooms, um, I think virtual classrooms here, in classrooms within a school, in schools within neighborhoods, and neighborhoods within cities, and cities within regions. Uh, you can imagine a, a hierarchy, perhaps not that fulsome, but, but perhaps much of it, um, where you have agents within agents and we can summarize things at higher levels. And the patterns that we see at higher levels might be rather different than the patterns we see at lower. Think uh, individual, their family, their school, et cetera. Um, in general, it might be more of a network than strictly a, a tree structure, but uh, it can be very powerful to think about nesting in, the, in these sort of uh, summary relationships at, at higher levels of aggregation. And indeed, this, this relationship between the micro scale and the meso scale, the medium scale and the macro scale is often what motivates a lot of agent-based modeling. Because sometimes we know a lot more about one of those than we do about the other. And we're really interested in extending our knowledge from the micro scale to 
What is it going to tell us about the macro scale? What is it going to tell us if we know a lot about how people behave and their risk perceptions and their decision making? What's it going to tell us about where COVID-19 is going? Or maybe we know a lot about the macro scale and we're trying to understand why do we see those patterns of residential segregation and we create a micro scale model that's more aimed at theory building. Why do we see these patterns? Um, and often you'll see rather different emergent behavior over these different scales. Agent-based modeling does uh, capture not only very empirically rich models, but also stylized models. And here we think of models, again, we hark back to my comments before, uh, two lectures ago, of models as thinking tools or thinking prostheses, think a crutch for the mind. Helps us behave as if we didn't have a broken leg or at least get a lot of the way there um, uh, by compensating for our limitations uh, for, our, for, our, for our leg by providing us another way to get around models or like that computationally. And the limitations here, ladies and gentlemen, lie not in our femur or tibia, um, not in our leg bones, but in our, in our wetware and our ability to think through these issues for even the most quantitative of us. Um, and uh, here we often um, talk about modeling for insight or modeling for learning. We have a model, not because it represents some actual representation of something we really believe is going on in the world. It's not a full working hypothesis for what's going on in the world. Rather, it's it's a way for us to reason more consistently. We say, if it were this way, what would we see? And we sort of use that to sharpen our thinking about how things might fit together. So models here are not something that depicts an exact real world situation, but a device for thinking through how things might compose together in a way that might more quickly spot blind spots in our reasoning and in our thinking. Um, and so they're just focusing on a few essentials. My colleague, Carl Simon at, at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan, speaks about these as being, in terms of modeling, a bit like caricatures. Some of you may have seen caricatures of previous uh, Canadian prime ministers, which uh, may, um, may depart from actual photographic type depictions by accentuating certain features, perhaps a, a most pronounced chin, for example, or a low, larger protuberance of a nose, um, uh, perhaps uh, certain exaggerated uh, facial hairs. And uh, these, these are not meant to be exact depictions of a real world situation, but they bring out some underlying truth that makes it immediately useful and recognizable. And the game of life that some of you may have encountered uh, provides a wonderful example uh, of this that is illustrated in any logic for anyone who would like to try it out. Came out of work by uh, adapting ideas from von Neumann of the von Neumann architecture uh, through a mathematician, George Conway. And this is an example of a cellular automata, which is actually computationally universal. Anything that can be done on a Turing machine, ladies and gentlemen, can be undertaken with the game of life, with an infinite, uh, infinite board. Uh, a weird factoid, I began my programming career with the game of life, programming my first programs for other people in assembly language, uh, creating games of life when I was in high school. A um, uh, bit of a vignette there. Uh, so uh, agent-based models uh, summary, uh, they capture continuous and discrete, uh, um, well, okay, they depict one or more populations and in so doing, uh, they have some strengths. Uh, they, they can capture uh, heterogeneity differences that are both continuous and discrete in nature. Um, uh, they allow us to, um, to therefore capture richness of, of different situations that might lead us to target different features. So we could think, for example, in an ABM about vaccinating all people who um, you know, are in a certain situation in life, a certain age, certain, uh, certain uh, occupation perhaps, uh, certain chronic diseases without blowing up our model in terms of the number of, of states. We can represent network context, spatial context, ge uh, you know, geographic context included, multi-level nesting, we can capture situated decision-making and learning by agents. 
Um, the fact that an agent sitting in a car um, uh, because of bends in the road or poor visibility because of weather might only see a certain distance ahead of them. Perhaps it's because there's a large, uh, a larger vehicle in front of them. And so they have to apply you know, extra cautious braking. And so we, we can simulate these, these effects at an individual level that ripple up to cause say a traffic jam. And we can have learning that reflects that situated uh, element of, of where they're located. We can capture over time information about evolution of an agent that allows us to compare it to data from the world or that might motivate an intervention. For example, in our province, ladies and gentlemen, immunity to COVID-19 does not look long lived compared to something like measles where you might be um, secure lifelong immunity via infection or via proper uh, two doses of, of measles related vaccines. COVID-19 infection uh, immunity will probably uh, probably die out within less than a year. So we might have multiple shots and maybe there's rules governing who gets shots depending on the most frequent shot they've gotten. And we can keep track of an individual's history in terms of their history of, of getting vaccinations to know if they're eligible for a new one, for example. Um, we can um, visual, visually depict these, uh, whether it's uh, on networks or in space, uh, geographically, um, uh, or, or in terms of um, stick figures in ways that can aid communication. Um, and uh, we can often use a model like this, being a fairly low-level model compared to others, to often test out strategies. I had spoken uh, last time, and I'm, I'm conscious we're going uh, uh, over here, so I'm going to wrap up in just a moment. In system dynamics modeling, we disaggregate a model, again, by characteristics. We divide the population up into, say, susceptible individuals, exposed, infected, and recovered. Um, uh, where, whereas with agent-based modeling, we're, to, we're taking a given person in the population, and they keep track of what state they're in. In a system dynamics model, we count the number of people in each state and we don't get into who it is. If it's the same person who's here now, who was here before, in an agent-based model, we can. And each person keeps track for, can keep track of their history, for example. In an agent-based model, we can nest environments in a way that just is not possible within uh, system dynamics models. There's many benefits. We don't have time uh, to, to each tradition. We don't have time to go over them, but I uh, have posted these slides in a way that may, um, may merit some uh, reflection on your part. And I'm glad to answer questions about these because these provide a little bit of a Rosetta Stone for knowing um, which technique might you apply in, in different circumstances. And I've given it in different ways, contrasting benefits, motivations for individual-based modeling, motivations for agent-based modeling. And with those words, ladies and gentlemen, I will close this lecture and I will uh, open office hours with a five minute break. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate your attention. Next time we're coming together to cover the final of the three traditions, another individual-based tradition of discrete event simulation. And as we'll see, that tradition, uh, like all of these, can work as complements to one another and uh, can work collectively to create hybrid models of formidable strength, flexibility, uh, and, and uh, power in terms of easing our learning. Thank you very much.